We all know chess, the game played on the 8x8 checkerboard with six different pieces, the pawns, rooks, knights, bishops, queen, and the king. It's undoubtedly one of the most famous board games of all time, known for its seemingly infinite complexities that can take a lifetime to master. And even then, it is not guaranteed. Then we saw the chess computer, and although chess is far from being solved from computers, most positions can be calculated with an accuracy far past what people can realize by themselves. Because of this, it is fair to assume that people may think that chess players will slowly lose playstyles, and to become one of the best players, you must not only be versatile, but you must try your best to play as well as a computer instead of inventing new ideas of your own. Of course, this concept is still very far away and will unlikely be a problem for hundreds of years. Though it does pose an interesting question. Will there need to be a successor to chess? Today I would like to discuss exactly that with a game mode that has gained a small amount of popularity within the chess community. 4-player chess. Yeah, what a concept, right? Instead of there being 2 players, you now have 4. The board is enlarged with 4 groups of squares with the dimensions of 3x8 added onto the regular 8x8 board that regular chess is played on, with each player having their pieces set up in exactly the same configuration. Though the pieces will still move the same as 2-player chess, there are some important details to point out. Before I do, I would like to mention that I will try to keep everything basic, but if you are not aware of the rules or basic strategic concepts of chess, then I recommend my video titled, The Ultimate Guide to Chess for Beginners, as I will be building upon the knowledge you can gain from this. Anyways, let's actually get into this mode a bit deeper. First off, we should look at the differences between chess and its 4-player mode. Some important things to note are the differences in the rules compared to normal chess. First, pawns promote when they move 6 spaces forward, which means this rule technically hasn't changed. The difference is that the pawns don't need to reach the opposite side of the board to promote. To find the promotion square, look at the first square on the other half of where your pieces begin. Due to the limitation of pawns not reaching the opposite side of the board without promoting, on passant is no longer possible in any form. Regardless of these rules, pawns will still move the same according to each individual player, only being able to move further away from themselves in a straight line or if they were to capture, then diagonally. When playing 4-player chess in free-for-all format, which is the game mode we will be discussing at length today, we need to discern who gets which place from first to fourth. There are actually two ways this can be done. The first is elimination based. In this case, most people will be happy with how each player is ranked. First to get eliminated is fourth, next is third, then second, and the remaining player gets first. Though this seems like a good idea and definitely has its merits, there is also another way to decide who gets which place, and this is by a point system. How does this point system work? It's actually pretty simple. Pawns are worth 1 point, knights are worth 3, bishops and rooks are both worth 5 points, and queens are worth 9. Though it is important to mention that queens that were promoted from pawns will still only be worth 1 point. Other ways to gain points are checkmating, which will net you 20 points, stalemating yourself is another 20 points, checking 2 players at once will give you 5 points, and checking all 3 opponents at once will give you 20. The point system makes 4-player chess much more complex, because instead of lasting longer than others, you are now rewarded for capturing more material. One interesting circumstance is if you were to solely eliminate 2 players and have 1 opponent left, you could just immediately claim a win instead of playing on because you have such a major lead in points that if you gave your opponent 20, you would still win. It is important to note that you need to have more than 20 points to claim your win. However, I wouldn't take the specifics of the point system itself to heart as this is a new way to score the game, so it is subject to change. Regardless of all of this, none of it is as important as the last and most obvious rule that defines the entire game. Who goes first and who goes last? In 4-player chess, we start with red and go clockwise to blue, yellow, and then lastly green, and then restart the cycle. Why is this so integral to 4-player chess? This all has to stem from game theory and the idea of initiative versus information. 
In four-player chess, the game is much less about concrete evaluations and instead about the previously mentioned initiative versus information. But we must define what these two terms are in the context of four-player chess. Initiative is the ability to move before others, which normally decides how the other players must react, whether it's by directly confronting the ideas that the first player has or by ignoring them. They must, at the very least, be acknowledged. Information, or at least the one who has the most of it, must play with acknowledgement to players with more initiative. However, this does have its advantages as the plans or ideas of the initiative holder will inevitably be revealed sooner, which will be explained further later on. In two-player chess, initiative and information is much easier to quantify. White has the initiative and black has the information. In this case, since it is only two players, the game can have many more predictable moments for both sides such as recapturing a piece or making a move that is offensive or defensive in nature. Because of this, it is considered that white has the advantage. However slight it may be, as time goes on, when both sides are playing concretely, the information and initiative themselves start to dwindle in usefulness, as often the options for challenging moves or ideas decreases in possibility. Once Black has made the response according to White's first move, White now has information on what Black's previous moves were, and usually can determine what Black's best course of action may be, and this is how White retains a small advantage for moves to come. This process continues to repeat itself after every move. When we look at this idea in the lens of 4-player chess, we see something much different. When we start, Red has the entire initiative, and Green the entire information, whereas yellow and blue are somewhere in between. Now this does sound very similar to another game, poker. However, the difference between the two is that there are rounds in poker, whereas four player chess is cyclical and continues to build upon a series of initiative and information. If one player starts attacking another, we understand what they are doing. However, if we initiate the attack, everyone else will know what we are doing. The reason why poker and four-player chess are similar is because of the idea of the Nash equilibrium, which is defined as a stable state of a system involving the interaction of different participants, in which no participant can gain by a unilateral change of strategy if the strategies of others remain unchanged. The stable state refers to a rule or guideline that is in the best interest of both parties to follow in order to not complicate situations for themselves. The part that makes it seem like four-player chess does not follow this theorem is in which no participant can gain by a unilateral change of strategy if the strategies of others remain unchanged. In general, this would not be applicable to four-player chess, not only due to its changing nature, but from strategic ideas that may not have presented themselves until the latter stages of the game. But if we instead refer to the general idea of attacking or staying neutral with an opponent, this equilibrium fits perfectly. The Nash equilibrium is able to be applied to non-cooperative games. This relies on the relationship between only two parties with four possible outcomes, either both attacking each other, which is a negative for both players, one attacking the other, which is positive for the attacker and negative for the neutral player and vice versa, or neither of them attacking each other, which is neutral. Although stating one, minus one and zero in the graph, this is circumstantial as to how positive or negative the consequences of an action will be and must be assessed in each individual position. This is more about risk assessment than objective calculations due to the amount of players and decisions possible in the game. And to rephrase this, this gives attacks not an objective evaluation, but rather a statistical one, with either high or low reward and risk to yourself. But there aren't just two players, are there? There's four. We can apply the Nash equilibrium through relationships with each other. Where originally there were four states between two players, there are now 12 different relationships to look after. Since each player has only one move per turn, and even though you can make a multi-purposed move, 
it is reasonable to assume that you can only attack one player at a single moment in time. This is important because now we understand that there are not only 12 states, which is as many relationships there are, but there are also four potential aggressive states within these 12 relationships. Now the significance of information finally reveals itself. The one with the final move of a cycle of attacks understands who is being aggressive towards who and has a possible chance to gain from the situation either by teaming up on one player or by staying completely neutral and letting two players weaken themselves. Now that we know about initiative and information, it is time to give some general advice to help you out when you play. When playing this game, we notice that the person on our left plays after us and then the other two players get to move after that. It is important to keep note of this because when you play, the person that moves immediately after you will have potential initiative against you, which is very dangerous. Because if they attack you, there are two others that might try to capitalize by attacking you as well. This is often why it's considered to be safer to castle on your right, so that if the player on your right does try to attack your king, you have the next move to respond and there are no players in between to make you worry. And it is the exact same reason why it is considered to be easiest to attack the player on your right, as others may try to join in on the attack. It is also a fair conclusion that you will want to see the player on your left eliminated first, so you do not have to deal with major threats as mentioned. Another piece of advice is in most cases, it is important to avoid initiating or allowing trades whenever possible, because the less pieces that you have, the lesser your chances of defending or coordinating an attack of your own. Trading can have its uses when you are distracting an opponent, leaving them open for attack, but do remember that when you exchange your pieces for points, you cannot reverse it. The next piece of advice is who you want to eliminate first. And although I did say that you do want to eliminate the person on your left first, which does remain true, it is more important to not eliminate the person opposite to you, as this will leave you in the middle of both of your remaining opponents which greatly increases your chances of elimination. The last piece of advice I would like to offer to you is to remain patient. In most cases, it is best to make slow, improving moves to understand better what your opponents are planning. The worst thing you can do is overextend yourself while attacking, which is one of the easiest ways to get eliminated first. In summary, 4-player chess is more about chance than about objective decisions and you need to calculate the risk for every idea you have and decide whether or not it is worth the reward. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one.